Yes or no to this statement, science refutes God. A debate from Intelligence Squared US. I'm John Donvan. We have four superbly qualified debaters who will be arguing for and against that motion, science refutes God. Our debate goes in three rounds, and then the audience votes to choose a winner, and only one side wins. Ladies and gentlemen, Lawrence Krauss. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I actually wore this T-shirt for the subject of the debate. Um, <laughs> And it's the center of the debate, and it's clear. The motion is science refutes God. And Michael and I have the distinct advantage here of arguing in favor of the motion because, in fact, we have evidence, reason, logic, rationality, and empirical methods on our side, whereas their opponents have vague hopes and fears. And uh, they're arguing in favor of a motion that's hanging on for its existence by mere shreds of emotional and ideological spaghetti, much like this type provided by the flying spaghetti monster, one of the many equally irrational gods which science provides no support for. But I first want to begin by clarifying the nature of the motion, because the motion isn't science disproves God, it's science refutes God. And that's very important, because you can't disprove a notion that's basically vague and unfalsifiable. I could not, I, there's no way to disprove the notion that God didn't create all of us 15 seconds ago with the memories of, of the amusing comments we heard before that. There's no way we can disprove that. Okay? And, and it, that's really important to recognize that those kind of unfalsifiable notions are unfalsifiable, as I say. But we can ask, is it rational to expect that that's likely? And tonight I want to emphasize that 500 years of science have demonstrated that God, that vague notion, is not likely. It's irrational to believe in God. Now, to refute God means refuting several claims. One, that are all based on faith, not evidence. One, that God is necessary. Two, that there is evidence for God. And three, that that belief is rational. And the point is that the progress of science has shown over and over and over again that all, the answers to all those three questions are no, 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 no. Now, my own scientific field is cosmology, and uh, that's a study of the origin and evolution of the universe as a whole. And it's where science and religion sort of confront each other, and creation myths have abounded throughout human history, and science confronts those creation myths. And we'll talk about that, I'm sure, at some point in the, in, in the debate. But I want to point out that our opponents, I, I'm pretty sure, are going to argue first that one aspect of science that supports, perhaps, the belief in God is this notion that the universe is apparently fine-tuned for life. I hear that a lot. And because uh, it was fine-tuned so life could exist, that is a remarkable and, in fact, cosmic misunderstanding. Because it's the same kind of misunderstanding that led people to believe in special creation for life on Earth before Darwin. It looked like everything was designed for the environment in which it lived. But what Darwin showed us was that a simple proposition, namely that there's genetic variation among a population combined with natural selection, meant that you didn't need supernatural shenanigans. That, in fact, all the diversity of life on Earth could arise from a single life form by natural law. And he didn't know, he, what he showed was it was plausible based on the evidence. He didn't know about DNA, he didn't know about uh, the details of genetic replication, but he showed it was plausible. And as I'll say, that's where we're at now as far as the understanding of the universe is concerned. Now, our, my opponents, I suspect, will, will argue the universe is equally fine-tuned for life, and they, in fact, uh, they will point out that certain fundamental parameters in nature, if they were different, we couldn't exist. Or they might boldly assert that, in fact, certain of these parameters are so strange and unnatural that they must have been established with malice of forethought, a forethought to ensure our existence. This, too, is an illusion. Just as bees need to see the color of flowers, but they're not designed to do it. If they couldn't see them, they couldn't get the nectar and reproduce. So what we're seeing here is a version of cosmic natural selection. We would be quite surprised to find ourselves living in a universe in which we couldn't live. In fact, that might be evidence for God. <laughs> but I want to point out that, in fact, the universe isn't particularly fine-tuned or conducive to life. Most of the universe is rather inhospitable to life. And in fact, perhaps the biggest fine-tuning problem in my own field of, of cosmology, something I'm, in fact, very proud to have proposed, in a sense, is that the energy of empty space is not zero. The weirdest thing you can imagine, that empty space weighs something. But 
Remarkably, the energy of empty space is 120 orders of magnitude smaller than we would naively predict. And if it were much bigger than we measure, it's true that galaxies couldn't form and planets couldn't form and, and intelligence squared debates couldn't happen. So the universe appears to be here because intelligence squared is here. Now that suggests religion, perhaps. But the point is, not that, that, fine, that claim of fine-tuning is ridiculous because, in fact, if the energy of empty space was zero, which is a by far a more natural value, the universe would be a better place for life to live. It, we all thought it was zero when I was a graduate student because that was a natural value. If it was zero, the universe would be a better place. In fact, you can show the value that it has now makes the universe the worst of all possible universes to live in for the future of life. So, so much for a universe created for us. <laughs> now, once Darwin had uh, removed the apparent need for God in, in evolution of life, the last bastion for God was the creation of the universe, how you can get something from nothing. And what we're in a remarkable situation of, of, of being in is precisely the same situation that Darwin existed in 150 years ago. Namely, we have a plausible explanation of how a universe could precisely come from nothing. If you ask what would be the characteristics of a universe that came from nothing, by natural laws, it would be precisely the characteristics of the universe we observe. And it didn't have to be that way. It could have been another way. And by nothing, and it, the, the, my opponents will say that by nothing, I'm not talking about nothing. But I'm talking about nothing. No particles, no radiation, no space, no time, and even no laws of physics. Our, my opponents might argue that the multiverse, which our universe might have spontaneously been created in, was created by physicists because they don't like God, because it's eternal and exists outside our universe, the same characteristics that God is supposed to have. But it wasn't created because we don't like God, although I don't like God. <laughs> it was, it, we've been driven to it by measurements. In fact, I don't even like the multiverse, but I've learned to force my beliefs to conform to the evidence of reality. That's where science differs from religion. There do remain deep philosophical and scientific questions that are unanswered, but God is not required or useful to explain any of them. And therefore, to conclude, science has taught us that we don't need God to create a universe, that there's no evidence for God, that the specific scientific claims of those who require God disagree with empirical evidence, and it's irrational. Science refutes God. So clearly, you should vote for our side. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence Krauss. And that is our motion, Science Refutes God. And here to speak...